Guyana on the 2nd of April 1810 that officially banned African culture on pain, on pain or death. Uh, without uh, much further ado, I introduce you to the issues we are going to be discussing this evening. You know, as usual, Sister Penders, did you know? <laughs> and then we go uh, straight into Rear Admiral Gary's best presentation, discussion on his presentation to the African Lands Commission. And so, Sister Penda, uh, did you know? Did you know? Okay. Well, a pleasant good evening to all our listeners out there. And I am, as was stated earlier on, Sister Penda, the did you know person. Today, I would like to speak to you on did you know how this land or nation called Guyana came into being? And later on in the other segments, we will be continuing with land and we will be covering such things as the legal aspects of land titling and acquisition to review how ownership is determined. And then the next program, I hope we will do the contemporary on even distribution of land and then the differences between ancestral crown land, state lands, etc. So today we want to go into how this nation or land called Guyana came into being. And I will ask for, as usual, the listeners to get their pens and paper out to see how many of these you get correct. Let's start. Do you know who was the first European record in recorded history, that is, alleged, huh? to have discovered Guyana. And if you said Sir Walter Rodney, an Englishman, you would be correct. Do you know what was the name Sir Walter Rod Raleigh gave to the land he was alleged to have, to have discovered? The name was El Dorado, meaning city or land of gold. Do you know which country bordering Guyana today was also called Guyana? Okay, that country is Venezuela. Now you can put the pieces together, why the border dispute? Do you know which was the first European nation to colonize Guyana and the year that occurred. It was the Dutch in 1600. And since its discovery, how many European nations have had control of Guyana? The three European nations that have had control of Guyana are, I'm giving you time to write and to see if you're right, the Dutch, in 1616, followed by the French from 1782 to 1784, and finally the British from 1803 to 1966 when we gained our independence. Do you know that the three counties, Essequibo, Babis, and Demerara, were three separate colonies? And do you know when the Dutch settled in Essequibo and Berbice? In Essequibo, in 1621, in Berbice, 1627. And do you know when Demerara was colonized and by which European nation? If you guess the Dutch in the mid 18th century, you are correct. Do you know when Britain first took control of the colonies Essequibo, Babis, and Demerara? The answer, 1796. And do you know to whom the British gave possession of these three colonies in 1802? Answer, Britain relinquished control of the colonies to the Batavian Republic. And do you know 
where the Batavian Republic was and which nation controlled it. The Batavian Republic was the Dutch colony of Suriname, which was controlled by the French. And do you know what happened to the three colonies one year later? The colonies were recaptured by Britain. Do you know what year the three colonies were officially ceded to Britain? They were ceded to Britain in 1814. And do you know when the three counties formed one country? When the three counties were formed into one? The three counties became one country in 1831, and it was named British Guyana. Now, do you know what percentage of Guyana is covered with water? Almost 10%. And do you know which is longer? Our border with Suriname or our border with Venezuela? If you said Venezuela because of the disputes, you will be wrong. Suriname is longer with 836 kilometers and Venezuela is 789 kilometers. Now finally, do you know what year the capital of Guyana was named Georgetown? What was its previous name? All right, students. The capital of Guyana was named Georgetown in 1812. Its previous name was Stabrook, hence her Stabrook Market. As I said earlier on, the next Do You Know segment will look at the legal aspects of land titling and acquisition to review how ownership is determined, the contemporary uneven distribution of land, and the difference between ancestral crown states, etc. But before I say bye to you this evening, I would like to leave you with a note and a task. And the note is, please note that all the wars and betrayals among European nations in respect to Guyana, that is, in respect to their acquisition, because there were many wars fought between the three nations that I stated in order to possess this land. It was not done mainly to possess the land, but to control the labor of Africans so as to maximize the exploitation of the land. Because during all this time, Africans were here working on the forced labor camps called plantations. Now your task for next time is to research as much as you can about the name and administration of the capital before it was named Stabrook. I say a shay and until our next meeting. Thank you very much, Sister Penda, for uh, Do You Know. Uh, do you know, Sister Penda, that uh, Rear Admiral Rear Admiral Gary Best made a fantastic presentation to the Land Commission on, in respect of ancestral lands for African people. Yes, I was there, and it was awesome. <laughs> and I think it was because of that and the presentation that was given by um, Dr. Huyusi, um, Commander Huyusi, and also um, Brother Eric's presentation that we realized that the amount of work and preparation had to be done. So that is how we formed the Reparation Land Committee to help people to present their work to the land. Brother Best seems to be uh, the most recent of, uh, forgive me saying this, uh, noted academics to have come to have led the Guyana Defense Force, Brigadier Granger. Yes. Um, I can't remember what is his correct rank, Joe Singh. Yes. Whatever is his rank, Joe Singh, but he has got some tremendous um, academic work and now brother. Yes, and now I, brother I'm West. very impressed. And um, 
what I did tonight was just to let people understand the struggles that the, you know, the battles and the things that came into being to have this land, Guyana. But I know that Rear Admiral now is going to take it to another level, and he's going to let the public know tonight, you know, what it is, why we at reparations, why we are fighting for what we are asking for. I mean, after you hear the presentation, are you going to open the lines? Well, I don't think that you could have done a better introduction, but the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for your business. Thanks, thanks for inviting me on the show. Thank you. Yes. Your presentation to the Land Commission stated that Africans indigenized parts of Guyana, um, meaning to say that Africans are indigenous to Guyana, um, and established the basis for the modern state of Guyana. Speak to us uh, about those two aspects of your presentation to the Land Commission, please. Well, in the, there is no universal definition of the term indigenous. I think um, the various organizations thought that if we try to have one word, one definition for indigenous, it could create a lot of problems over time because people occupy lands and places over time. But the UN has an, a definition for indigenous people. The UN itself has a, definition, has a definition for indigenous people, but it's not claiming to be a universal definition. If you look at the, definition, the UN definition of indigenous people, and you relate that to what occurred among the African people in Guyana, then it's difficult not to come to the conclusion that the Africans indigenize the land and ought to be con considered as indigenous people to Guyana. And let me just quote the UN definition. Oh, sorry, please, sir. <laughs> And this is the UN definition. Indigenous peoples are inheritors and practitioners of unique cultures and ways of relating to people and the environment. They have retained social, cultural, economic, and political characteristics that are distinct from those of the dominant societies in which they live. Despite their cultural differences, indigenous peoples from around the world share common problems related to the protection of their rights as distinct peoples. Now, if you look at this definition, you will see it fits squarely within everything that happened during enslavement. Because during the period of enslavement, the enslaved Africans continued to maintain their cultural identity within the broader framework of colonial domination. So they were a distinct people as a minority within the colonial domination. So it fits within the UN definition of an indigenous people. And at the same time, indigenous people continue to fight for their rights. And we are continuing, as descendants of enslaved Africans, to fight for those cultural rights that were interrupted from time to time through, uh, through colonization, whether it's British, the Dutch, or the French. So in that sense, and, and based on the, the definition of UN definition, we can see that the lands were indigenized by the enslaved Africans. But of course, when we get to ancestral land, you'll see that the whole notion and concept of ancestral land, as I understand it, also reflects some of the tenets that are located within the UN definition. We see the African practices are quite similar to the definition, the UN definition. So that's the basis of, of making, of um, saying to the Commission that yes, the enslaved Africans indigenized um, the lands in Guyana that they worked on while they were here. Okay, and the other point that you made of significance, um, well, you made many significant points, but this one is interesting, that the indigenous Africans formed the basis of the modern Guyanese state. Well, well I'll put that in context. When I, said, um, when, I said, when I made that statement to the commission, what I meant was the enslaved African humanized the coastline and, and actually gave the birthing of the nation state today. And that coastline was humanized through the, the work that they did, the building of the plantations, the creation of the roads, the dams, the interconnected waterways. So it was the enslaved Africans who humanized the coastline, and as I argued, that created the, the new nation, the birthing of the new nation state. So it should be, it should be seen in that context. Um, this is not to displace any, the work of any other, any other group, because as you would recognize, 
that the, uh, the, the Amerinos were forced into the hinterland with the arrival of the, um, of the British, the Dutch and the French. They were forced into the hinterland, so they were no longer on the coastline per se. So one has to give credit to the enslaved Africans for humanizing the coastline by developing it, developing the plantations, the road network, the infrastructure um, network at the time, and therefore giving birth to the nation state of Guyana today. Another interesting point that you made in your presentation to the Land Commission is that African Guyanese history does not begin with, the, with their arrival in Guyana, and that it goes back much further than that. Um, can you um, develop that for the audience, especially within the context of the indigenizing of the land and the establishment, the humanizing of the coastline? Well, I think the point that we should make, the point we should understand is that our history did not begin in 1492. That's the first thing. 1492 creates a picture of European, enslaved African, and the, the, the I would say the, re, the remnants of the, of the genocidal Amerindian, because they were killed and mutilated on their arrival, and they retreated to the interior. So that picture is a picture of domination and subordination. But our history did not start in 1492. Our history goes back to ancient Kemet, which is Egypt. And I think genetics have already shown in the world that the origin of life, the origin, the oldest DNA is still traced back to the African people. Um, the conspiracy that occurred over the, over the centuries in keeping that public is no longer valid because the DNA is there. But in the context of Guyana and the rest of the Caribbean, to think that our history started in 1492 really is to do a disservice to our people. We have to go back to ancient Egypt, Kemet. And to put that in context, let me say that the, the entire African continent was peopled by African people. Today, Egyptians say they're going to Africa, and they are in Africa. And I will tell you why. Because prior to the invasion, the Arab invasion, that's the invasion from Saudi Arabia, the entire Africa was populated by African people. That's right. Ancient Egypt, Kemet, and we have the, the Aksum Empire, King Azana, a massive empire. Then we have the Nubian Empire that stretched across Ethiopia and from Egypt to Ethiopia. And then you had the Kush Empire, mm -hmm. have the great Zimbabwean Empire. There are great civilizations that existed. So one must understand that the Horn of Africa, which is the north of Africa, those were the early civilizations coming out of Egypt, ancient Egypt, that was Kemet, coming out of ancient Egypt, Kemet, into northern Africa. So the Red Sea was an important lifeline, the Nile was an important lifeline. King Azan, um, he controlled massive territories. He actually had territories within um, Arabia, which is now known as Saudi Arabia. So they were conquered also. So they're a great civilization. So to teach history, to teach African history or a history period, one has to start, not in 1492, to start when uh, we started as a people and were discovered as a That's people. Right. So that's important. And I think if we start our history in the correct place, right. we'll come to understand and recognize that colonization and enslavement was another part of history, but not the beginning of our history. And we should be able to recognize and reflect on our own great civilizations and have even more respect and understanding for ourselves. And the history of the Indian, in the, of our um, Indians, did not start in 1492 either. They have thousands of years of civilization, just like our Amerindian brothers. Could it be that the displacement, seeing that we have uh, decided to begin our history from, from Africa, could it be that the displacement of Africans from their lands in Africa uh, mirrored the displacement of Africans from lands here in Guyana? In a sense, but I, I, I would like to, to say, uh, without fear, without any, um, the fear of contradiction, my own self, my own self, that the 1492 beginning of history really is more Afro-Saxon in itself. I don't think it's a true recognition of who we are and where we are. And it might be because of where the, um, lots of our, the people coming out of the um, colonization, where they were educated and so forth. So I think as a, when I reflect on it, it seems as though it, it's really a Eurocentric view of, of um, the African 
a Eurocentric view of the new Guyana as opposed to a Guyanese view, and in particular an, Af an uh, African-centric view of the African Guyanese, where the Guyanese view of the Guyanese should not place our history in 1492. We should, be, we should have prepared or begin to prepare to write our history beginning with the beginnings in ancient Kemet, India, and before the Asiatic Bridge. Now let me make the point that remember South, South, Africa, South America and Africa, was, um, they, it was one continent. It broke away. But notwithstanding, notwithstanding where we begin our history from, another fact is the fact that Africans were displaced from their lands in Africa to be brought here. Um, and even here, having humanized uh, the coastline, the Venn Commission talks of these, speaks of the amount of work that we did. Um, do you think that it is just for us to be awarded a percentage of Guyana's territory um, for that loss, as compensation for that loss? I think it's more than just. I think it's, it is deserving and it's the only thing one we can actually do. But let me make a distinction between reparations, which is a worldwide movement, and partial reparations, land reparations, which was my submission. It is not to say it's not a substitute for reparations that is owed to the, to the enslaved Africans and descendants of enslaved Africans across the entire world. There are three periods, I would think, of land deprivation. The first you mentioned, because one has to at least assume, even if, even if one is not so certain, that we came from a landmass in Africa. And therefore, when our people were kidnapped and illegally transported this part of the world, they were uprooted from their lands. So that is the first land deprivation. The second land deprivation occurred after over 200 years of indigenizing the land without any pay, that at emancipation, those lands were not handed over and turned over to us, against our cultural expectations. Mm -hmm. And the third deprivation, I like to think, is that independence, 1966, post-independence, the British did not create a regime for the lands to be handed over to us, uh, unlike lands being handed over to the our, um, indigenous brothers, the Amerindians, Neither did the nation state of Guyana make that a primary activity for the, for the, the, the descendants of enslaved Africans. So there are three periods I, I, I see when we were deprived of land. And based on those uh, three periods, it is only just that land be set aside as compensation for the deprivation of land in Africa, the deprivation of lands indigenized, and the deprivation of lands at the at the point of um, independence when we expected the state, the Ghana state, which is a successor to the British state, to at least done, uh, um, do the same thing that the British state had done in relation to our Armenian brothers. Um, everything that you have spoken about uh, looks back. You look back to Africa. We look back to the humanizing of the coastline and we look back to independence. But is this claim for land, does it have a futuristic orientation. How do you see this claim for land affecting the current state of Africans in Guyana, current economic and social state? Well, if we're going to start from the economic and social state, we have to agree that the economic and social state of the African people is directly connected to how land was managed during enslavement Excellent. and during colonization, in the sense that our culture, our culture cultural connection to land in Africa is a communal culture. Yes, the, the chief held the land for the benefit of the, the, his chiefdom, for want of a better term, and for those yet unborn. And that's important, as the, um, Dr. Kimani, the UC, pointed out in his book on libation. The chiefs held land for those who were yet unborn, in addition to those who were around them. In today's world, we call that a trust. That's what the British call a trust. Okay. So we have to understand, and then the subsequent deprivation of those lands, and at the time of emancipation, when instead of the lands being handed over to us, as was expected, we had to go out and purchase lands, that in itself created this 
this uh, unique disproportionate economic imbalance of the descent of the freed Africans and consequently the descendants of enslaved Africans. We have this economic imbalance beginning there, aided by the British too, because they, they in, interfered with the village system that we developed. But the thing that uh, we were considered non-humans, and within a few years we were able to purchase land and set up a village system, a government system, which was, which was particularly not only relevant, but a replica of the village systems we had in Africa. Exactly. Is ample evidence, cognitive evidence, of us maintaining our spiritual, cultural, political, and social connections that we had in Africa, even during over 200 years of enslavement. So to go forward, as, which is your question, yes. For us to go forward, you have to understand the debilitating effect of that period of enslavement and what it did to us both economically and um, spiritually. But to go forward, I think the best way to approach it is to create a, a trust, a land trust. That is to say that I believe that what we need to do to go forward to ensure that this, this sort of restorative justice, this, this uh, unsettling of, the ancest of our ancestors and our ancestral spirits, this disconnect that we find um, amongst our own people, this lack of respect in many instances, lack of understanding, the ignorance that pervades among our people, is to establish a land trust and provide for the descendants of enslaved Africans a portion of land as partial reparations. I think that is what's going to take us forward. That is what's going to cure some of the ills that we feel. Because unlike many people, I don't think they recognize how spiritually Africans are connected to land. We may, not, we may not recognize it, but we are spiritually connected to the land. Because remember, the cosmic order of, of, of Africa Excellent. is God. Mm -hmm. We deal with God for us. We deal with ancestors, ancestral spirits. Then we deal with animals and living things. And then we deal with objects and non-living things. So God is central in, Afri in the African uh, concept. But the ancestors are important. And the ancestors introduced that spiritual um, content within our life being. So when you look at the, what we call the divine cosmic order within the African um, uh, spirituality, the African living, and as, as I said earlier, that is closely connected to, even to the UN definition of indigenous rights. So if we look at that, and we were to bring that forward um, today and take it forward, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to situate it within the concept of land. And land includes water in this context. So my recommendation to the commission was for an ancestral lands act, a portion of land to be identified for the descendants of um, enslaved Africans, and that this land act to be statutorized, that it be written into the law in similar vein as we have the Amerindian Act, but with, a diff with different modalities. Because in this context, the, our Amerindian brothers have, quite rightly so, homesteads and farmlands, because that is connected to their culture. But what I recommend is the land be held in a trust, and in trust for investment, the proceeds of which will go towards ameliorating, continuously ameliorating the conditions of the descendants of the enslaved Africans. I don't recommend um, um, farms, farmland, and homestead. That would not work for us, because the lands that we're talking about are occupied today by the state. Most of it, a significant portion of it, is under Gaisuku, which is the state. So really and truly you're talking about compensation elsewhere and not trying to convert what is already um, owned by the state and other persons and say these are the original African lands and therefore we should have that back. No, we should have an equivalent portion of land. And that will help to settle this, this ancestral this unity that we have, this fighting and tugging amongst each other because our ancestors are not, they're, they're not, they're not safe. They're still busy trying to figure out why is it we are not settled as a people here. In Kenya. Your, your definition of the um, social problem between Africans as an ancestral one is, is even, even more <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> I think the more he speaks is the more yes, he yes. brings, the brother brings a depth of understanding yes. uh, to the African, to 
to the African issues that um, we have not heard before. Um, is there a percentage of the land mass which you think that will be sufficient to settle this disquiet amongst our ancestors? Perhaps, when you, when you get into percentages, it could become a bit, <laughs> um, I, um, it could become a bit contentious, but I yes. think I want to ground it in some amount of empirical evidence. Yes, sir. And the empirical mm -hmm. basis of saying what I am about to say is rooted in the Venn Commission. And the Venn Commission, uh, if I'm correct, talked about an approximate 18,000 square miles of, of land mass was indigenized, um, humanized, and and uh, indigenized and humanized by the enslaved Africans. I think nothing short of that should what the, the lands that are going to be apportioned for the descendants of enslaved Africans as a trust, as an investment trust, right, should be made available, nothing short of that. But I also believe that a portion of the land offshore should be made available. And this is more significant than, than even, as equally significant or perhaps more significant than the land mass. The land that should be awarded, that should be made available offshore, most likely is going to be, if it's offshore, it's, it's going to be within, the, within an area that has um, hydrocarbons, because we know there's quite a lot of oil offshore. But that's not the basis of, the, of the, um, the recommendation. The base of the recommendation is that a land offshore, a portion of land offshore in the Atlantic Ocean is more than just compensation for the amount of lives that were lost in the Ashe. Atlantic Passage. And I think our ancestors that are still hovering over the Atlantic Ocean will be more than happy to recognize that we now have now given true credence right, to that uncertainty in their spirits yes. by a portion of land offshore in the Atlantic Ocean that now closes that, that harsh period of the Atlantic Passage when so many of us died in that Atlantic Passage. And the land and the portion of land on land is for those of us who survived and arrived here and our, de our descendants are now sitting in this room and living in this wonderful land. So I think it's only important that we recognize that. But let me come back to the to a point I made earlier about um, the differences and the difficulties we have among, amongst our people are connected to the unsettling of the African, the ancestral spirits. I don't think perhaps you recognize that when we were kidnapped and transported, illegally transported to this part of the world. People, um, Africans were, were taken from different hierarchies and totally mixed up. So you, had, you would have had the, the working class with the princely class and the kingdom class all mixed up. Different cultures became inter, um, interconnected on a slave ship. So a lot of that is still existing without us, without us recognizing it because there was a, a natural order of things in the continent. And as I mentioned, the great civilizations prior to the time when the Europeans landed in Africa. And the Europeans were trading with the Africans before. But the Africans had the great civilizations then. They were trading in North Africa. In West Africa, just below the Sudan, when you come down to the slave, slave ports, that's above the Zimbabwe, um, great civilization is what we have Sudan great civilizations and of course we have uh, King Azano who was an Ethiopian massive civilizations the Lalabella La um, churches when the 12 churches are still carved out to stone in the earth mm -hmm. that is the greatest wonder in the earth that is the greatest natural wonder seven churches carved out to stone in the earth in Ethiopia as a replica of Jerusalem. They said you really had to be righteous if you wanted to go to church there because you got claims on <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and and I don't think people rec recognize and I did mention to you sometime before Jonathan about Christianity and how one understand Christianity. Yes yeah, people don't understand that. That the the work the, a lot of work on Christianity uh, was done in that area just above uh, uh, Byzantine in Ethiopia it's, uh, in Egypt itself Egypt itself, Algeria, and uh, Tunisia. Tunisia. But those countries then were populated by Africans. Now they're po populated mostly by Arabs because of the invasion of, of the, 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 um, the Arabs um, into North Africa and the conquering of North Africa. But prior to that, so a lot of the work in Christianity um, was done by these noble African men who lived in those areas. 
And if you check um, King Azana's, uh, Ju during King Azana's rule, you find one of his coins with a cross. That, that is significant as to when the whole notion of the cross even reached Euro um, Ethiopia. What, be what, what became of Christianity and how it was practiced in the time of enslavement is completely different from the fact that Christianity was pioneered by, um, by Africans. Pioneered by Africans. Not only Constantine, who, um, who became converted subsequently, but Azana, King Azana was converted just around the same time. So Africans pioneered Christianity into North Africa. And today we have the Af Africans, uh, Christianity and, and Islam in a major contest because many of the, the areas where Christianity um, thrived, the, the Arabs came across and dominated with Could Islam. Could it be, Rear Admiral, and I'm listening carefully to what you're saying, that a part of that discontent and disaffection between African people here in Guyana today um, could be attributed to the subversion of that um, religious ethos to which they subscribe in Africa. As you pointed out, Christianity was in Africa. It was developed, it was pioneered in Africa. The majority of Africans in Guyana today are Christians, but yet we have this disquiet amongst, amongst ourselves. Could it be? I would say our ancestors are not Please. settled, <laughs> and therefore those spirits are not settled. All right. And uh, it is difficult, especially among born-again Christians, when you born again Christians, when you speak about ancestral spirits, I don't think they can make the connection. But there is a connection. I mean, this whole view of Christianity viewing African religion as something demonic, so to speak. Not understanding that Africans were pioneers also in Christianity. Because they were, they were worshipping different types of God. And they came around, they understood, they, they, they became pioneers. And so that, that great those great civilizations that stood before um, became Christianized at the same time. But not what we experienced during enslavement. And that award, mm -hmm. that award of a percentage of Guyana's land mass is going to help to settle? Uh, I believe so. I believe it's going to help to settle, settle the space of our, our ancestors. The thing that we're not divinely connected to some, to, to some, other, to some being, some other force, is really to, to, to believe that you're just all alone. Because we have soul, we have spirit, we have a soul. And uh, there is a connection. There well, you know, we have talked at length on the esoteric nature of the of this land claim. What are the legal basis? What are the legal? Is there any legal justification um, to support a claim for land in Guyana? Well, the, the justification, the legal justification, is factually based. If going back to the three periods of land deprivation, and that's why we come, we talk about restorative justice. Restoration is to is restoring someone to the position prior to the criminal act. Mm -hmm. And if we if we look at what occurred, to in order to restore the descendants of enslaved Af Africans to their prior position, it's 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 impossible to restore them back to Africa. So the restorative justice is to bring as close as possible to where you were before the criminal act, and the criminal act was enslavement. And therefore, that is the legal basis, that you need to restore someone who would have lost something before a criminal act. Mm -hmm. So that is why, that is the, le the legal basis that we were deprived of these lands, and therefore we have every right to be restored to land by the state, the state of Uganda, which is a successor in title to the state, the British state at the time of um, colonization, and at the same time, at the time of independence. So it is, it is difficult not to envision a legal basis. In addition to that, the case law is out there. The British introduced a number of concepts, legal concepts. And I like to say the same laws that imprison us, those same laws can free us. Uh, any unjust law that existed at the time of 1966, when we became independent. Oh, those, if those unjust laws are still in our books, those unjust laws have to go. We can't have unjust laws in our country. The laws that imprison us cannot remain, but we can still use some of those laws to, to liberate us. 
the British introduced a number of concepts. Concepts like terra nullius, meaning land belonging to no one. Session, that territory was ceded to them mm -hmm. through invasion. They introduced a number of legal concepts. To steal land, essentially to justify deprivation of land. It's almost terra nullius, it's like you're living in a five bedroom home, you're occupying one bedroom, and someone claims the other four bedrooms because you're not effectively occupying it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we have land uh, prescription. You can get prescription titled by adverse possession. Those are things that were introduced by the British, which is alien to the African communal land system. Yes. Communal land doesn't have a status in Guyana. It doesn't have status in Guyana. Okay. So there is a, okay. uh, there is a legal basis. There is a juridical basis because we have sufficient case law set up by the British especially Mabo versus the Queen of um, Queensland, yes. the case the British in yes. Australia. It is, it, is a, it is a dichotomous case because the Australia, it is a case in Australia when Australia has already taken over most of the land. But yet they said that native title existed. So the British came and said there is, not a, there is no native title. But there is no need for a native title. The chief will be in charge of all the land. He doesn't prepare a title exactly. that one can see somewhere. This is something time immemorial. So with their concepts, they, they use the, their legal concepts to, to steal the land and alienate the land from the people to themselves. Speak to us about the, about the trust. You mentioned earlier that the chief held the land um, on behalf of the, those unborn and that that was a trust. Um, the trust that you hope to uh, place the land which is going to be given to Africans uh, by the state. How does it operate? Who gets access to? Let us suppose um, a very Portuguese looking person comes, or a very Indian looking person comes and says, you know something, I'm a descendant of an African and I'm entitled to the benefits of this trust. Well, if he or she is a descendant, then he or she is entitled. I mean, the matter ends right there, mm -hmm. irrespective of what they look like. Mm -hmm. Because I was reading recently the survey in Brazil, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see. I, I lived uh, for, for four and a half year, years in Brazil as a student, so I think I understand the society. It's very color conscious. But I was surprised to see when you see two persons, a very light-skinned person, a very dark-skinned person. And when you looked at it, the one with light skin had much more African blood than the one with the dark skin. So we can find that happening. But to come to the land trust, the trust has to be a, uh, a statutory trust, a trust created by legislation. And the trust will have trustees drawn from the villages on a rotation basis. Because there are many African villages, and each village will nominate a trustee. But we will start with, I, w I recommend 17, no more than like 17 trustees to come from the villages on a rotating basis. And we should have at least seven permanent trustees who are professional trustees to keep the trust going. So on a rotation basis, the trustees will come from the various villages. So each village will get a chance to have representation yes. over a period of time. It's a perpetual trust, and this goes against the grain of English trust law, which says a trust should not uh, last more, a life, more than a life plus 22 years. But this is a perpetual trust because ancestral land mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. exists in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. ancestorship exists in perpetuity. And the descendants of enslaved Africans will exist in perpetuity. So you cannot have a trust that will die. The trust has to continue living. So that's how I see the trust. It's a trust for productive purposes. The, the uh, resources from which will go towards ameliorating continuously the condition of the, 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 the descendants of the enslaved um, Africans. Uh, the, there are many other areas concerned within a trust. You have to look at the, um, the, the rules that govern the trustees. And there's standard, there's standard um, rules that govern trustees. I mean, a trustee can be fired if he or she violates the trust. But this is a trust. This is an investment trust. This is a trust where the trust will provide loans, to can provide loans. To, um, to descendants of enslaved Africans, loans, grants. The trust also will, will protect, and at least I would expect that the trust will work towards 
redefining our identity, looking at, looking at us as, 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 um, as a people, ensuring that we're comfortable, ensuring that we, we, we're even more comfortable with our spirituality, with our history. The trust could provide resources, begins the additional education that is required for the, our people the descendants of enslaved Africans in understanding the, the true origin of its history and ensure that that history is slowly introduced into the general um, school system and among the, the, amongst the African populations. If I want a hundred acres in the entrusted land yeah. to do my own thing, can I get it? I would think so. Once there, there, must be the, there will be an application process and there will be a process of determining um, which projects can work and which cannot work and which can be funded. So the idea is to make land accessible to persons who wish to have them on a, a, a lease basis within the trust for productive purposes. The trust is to, is to generate resources, to generate as much financial resources as possible. So yes, I don't mean to say you, I don't think you meant Jonathan, you meant you as in a person. Because I can't speak for trust that is not even yet to be to please. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was yeah. what I was meaning to say, does that does that um, does that one hundred acres of land which is awarded to me lose its identity as a part of the It wouldn't because it wouldn't okay. be it wouldn't go to absolute title. Okay. It's in a trust. So it mm -hmm. would just remain as trust land on a lease to Jonathan for a period of time and then Jonathan can pass this this onto his his arm, um, his heirs and the signs, that is quite that is quite possible. That's why we call it a perpetual trust. The trust continues to exist. Excellent. Um, we notice, for instance, um, the significant appreciation of an interest in land in Guyana, especially with the um, finding of oil recently. Um, how urgent do you think it might be for us to proceed with making the state aware of the need to settle this issue on behalf of African people? I would say no. <laughs> I would say now is the time. Mm -hmm. In 1838 was the time. 1966 was the time. Now is the time. I don't think it can be more urgent than the no one. I think what is important also, if you look at the, the nation state is important. We're a nation of six peoples. The extent to which there isn't a comfort level amongst the different peoples is the extent to which we can have more conflict or intra conflict between the different peoples. And I think it's important that and I think the state I think the state understands it. Maybe the, and the state is probably looking to organizations such as Agda, Copy two fifty to come up with ideas and recommendations as to how the state itself can engage in this issue. But I make the point that the state is a successor state. It was always the state that intervened. It's the state that created all the difficulties for enslaved Africans. It was the British state that authorized um, slavery. It was the British state that authorized the beatings and the killings. It was the British state that controlled and deprived us of land. It was the British state that did the negatives. It, it is now the Guyanese state to do the positives. The state was always there and will continue to be there, so we can use the state. And ancestral land is important, and ancestral land should not be seen as land, lands that were bought by Guyanese. That became part of ancestral land, but that is not the essence of ancestral land. We were forced to buy those lands. Mm -hmm. If we didn't buy them and the lands were handed over to us, which was already indigenized, we would not have to speak of lands being bought. Ancestral land, and let me just, maybe just tell you what I think ancestral land is. Ancestral land can also be explained as land that enslaved Africans were culturally, spiritually, socially, economically, environmentally and sacredly connected to through continuous practices. And if you look at the divine cosmic order, we continue to manage the land in a particular way. So ancestral lands not only lands that were bought at the time of um, at the, in eighteen thirty eight, at the time of emancipation, 
the concept of ancestral land never left the continent of Africa. Once we maintain that cultural, social, economic, and sacred affiliation to the land, expressed through, um, through practices like burying a neighbor's string, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that the placenta is disposed of in the land. Those are cultural practices you find among African people. And we say, my neighbor's still bury yeah. Mm -hmm. Those practices continue throughout. And that is a root concept of ancestral land. Not simply lands that were bought. Yes, that is part of it. But I don't want my African brothers and sisters to see ancestral lands as lands that were only bought. Ancestral lands are lands which were deprived of in Africa, deprived of here, yeah. mm -hmm. lands you indigenize, are lands that you are culturally, spiritually, and sacredly connected to through that divine cosmic order that I explained about earlier. Oh. And as my as, yes, and as my do you know, <laughs> there is interest mm -hmm. that supply to everything. Mm -hmm. So on the eighteen percent thereabout, we have to look at the interest that ought to be added to that. So I'm glad that you used the word that the minimum. I am thinking that 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 we cleared has acquired interest over the years that we have been waiting. So maybe the 18% should be something like 30%. How do you respond, Mr. <laughs> Admiral? <laughs> I would say my, my own view about the matter is, uh, is given the nation state, and uh, I would like to see the entire process is a parliamentary process. I'd like to see the parliament involved in this entire process because I think it should go up to legislation. We could use the same model that the, was used for the for our Amerindian brothers and sisters, where we go through parliamentary process, have it debated. And I think that finally, if we start at a minimum of 18%, then if we remain at the minimum, at least we still satisfy. Anything above that, I think it should be uh, just parliamentary um, discussion and parliamentary discussion. I would like to um, suggest a percentage here <laughs> on the whole issue of interest. But I think that that land, is once, it is, um, once we agree to it, is settled. And it's not in the context of, I don't see us adding on to it, uh, whereby you have a certain amount of persons. No, not in the same, similar like the Amerindian concept. That's a fixed amount of land, both onshore and offshore. Maybe the offshore could be the interest, because um, the, 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 the 18,000 square miles did not include anything offshore. So that could be the interest. So that's the way I see it. But I think it should be a parliamentary process. It should be go, go, through, the, um, go through the parliament, get to the subcommittees have a discussion, have a rich debate on it, and then the decision is made to create the Ancestral Land Act, Ancestral Trust, and begin to settle the spirits of our ancestors. Brother Best, uh, the Guiana Reparations Committee would like to thank you for having contributed to the elevation of the discussion on reparative exactly. and restorative justice in the country. We thank you for your introduction of the concept of our being indigenous, to the land of Guyana. We thank you for uh, contributing to defining uh, land as a part of that uh, pr process of justice. And we thank you for contributing the idea of the trust from which all Africans will benefit and help to quell the disquiet amongst our yes. people. Thank you very much. Very you good. are a treasured and welcome <laughs> uh, resource to our mine. community. On behalf of Sister Penda and the rest of the Reparations Committee, yes, we until we meet special. on the last Sunday of next month for another in our series of programs on reparations now, we go out saying to you, reparations yes, now. now. Gonna better humble and pray for a brighter tomorrow. Cause so many youths don't.